السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام على بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, the all-merciful, the most merciful, uh, we praise him and we ask for God's peace and blessings to be upon all of the prophets and messengers and upon the prophet Muhammad and upon all who follow in their footsteps until the end of time. And may we be included among them and with them. Ameen. Uh, welcome back to The Beauty of Islam. Uh, and in this series, we've been looking at a few of the major concepts and principles in the religion of Islam. And in the first session, we kind of gave this large overview uh, of the major aspects of belief and worship uh, and purification of the heart, a little bit about who the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace and blessings of God be upon him, uh, and a little bit about the Quran, the holy book that was revealed to him. And then in session two, the previous session, we looked at Allah, uh, God, and his attributes and his most beautiful names, and Muslim creed and belief around the divine and the creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, namely his oneness and also his complete uh, dissimilarity from his creation, that he is far above and beyond in his perfection and in his beauty and in his majesty uh, any, anything in creation, but that we witness his names and attributes and his actions in the world in which we live, in his creation. Uh, glorious and exalted is he. So in this session, session three, we are going to study the good life. And this is a term that uh, we often hear, uh, particularly you know, in a religious context and maybe sometimes in a irreligious context. But what do we mean by the good life? What we'll talk about in this session, which will all be connected to this theme, it really will go back to, we'll focus on why did God create us? What's the purpose for which we were created? Um, and we'll talk about this idea of false life and true life. That there is a false life or a person could potentially be considered quote unquote dead while they're alive. And what does it mean to be truly alive or to have access to true life. And then lastly, we'll talk about the good life, which is the moral life, a life that is based on faith and morality, God willing. So we'll begin. Why did God create us? We've been using this really beautiful book, A Thinking Person's Guide to Islam by Prince Ghazi bin Muhammad. And he has really beautiful insights into these bigger questions. And he says that creation itself is an act of God's mercy. To be brought out of non-existence into existence, that God did so out of his mercy, and it was an act of mercy. And in the previous session, we looked at God's most beautiful names, and one of the names that we focused on is the All-Merciful, Ar-Rahman, the All-Merciful. And this is one of God's names that applies to all of creation. Everything in existence uh, was brought out of non-existence by him. And in that, him being all thing, the creator of all things, it is an act of mercy that he brought them into existence. So that is an aspect of his mercy that reaches all things. And that God sustaining us after he created us and continuously taking care of us, is also out of his mercy. So he created us to give us the opportunity to seek the greatest treasure and the greatest joy and bliss that is possible, which is to seek God himself. There is a famous uh, tradition. It's not uh, uh, there is debate whether this is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, himself, or if this is just a statement that has truth and validity, 
that has been accepted by scholars. And let's just say that scholars accept this as a fact, that there is a statement attributed to God in which he says, I was a hidden treasure and I love to be known. So I created my creation so that they can come to know me. So the greatest treasure is God himself and that he gave us this life in order to have that opportunity to reach our full potential. God tells us in the Quran another reason, which is related, it's actually the same reason, but in a slightly different way, God tells us in the Quran of another reason for which we were created. Allah says, the Arabic is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I only created jinn and mankind so that they may worship me. So jinn being another of God's creation in the unseen realm, uh, like angels are in the unseen realm, and that humans were created so that they may worship me. And worshiping God means that we have to come to know him. That worship is not something that is done accidentally. It's very intentional. So in order to truly worship him, we have to know him. And when we come to know him, we come to love him. So God created us, saying it in another way, to love him. And he created us to worship him, to come to know him, and to come to love him. So once again, it goes back to what we talked about in the previous uh, session, God's love and mercy. And it's really funny to me because a lot of times when people think about Islam, I don't hear Muslims talking about love a lot. Well, if that's the case, then if you've heard Muslims talk about their religion and they haven't talked about love, maybe they don't know that much. And if they learn more, they would see the centrality or it's just something that unfortunately is a misconception. Oh, that, you know, there isn't any love in Islam. It's all, well, what are you talking about? That there's so much beauty and mercy and love there. So he created us so that we could worship him and come to know him. That because when we engage in acts of worship, God places deeper understanding into our hearts and the light of faith and the lights of nearness to him are intensified through acts of worship. And it might be gradual for the vast majority of people. It's not like an overnight thing that we engage in this worship. One, because he is our Lord and he commanded us to do so. But that it's also the path of coming to know him and love him and then become beloved to him. And being granted his love, glorious is his majesty. So that's one of the... Uh, understandings or one of the reasons that is clearly mentioned in the Quran. Also, along with God creating us to worship him, he also created us with the freedom to choose whether to do so or not. So this is where things really get interesting. So God created us so that we could come to love him and know him and worship him and to believe in him. But he also created us with the freedom to choose to do so or not. And a lot of people, when they come into this world, the nature of the worldly life, the nature of being distant from the message and the messengers, oftentimes people will develop a rust around their hearts. Or they will be infatuated with worldly things that then can blind them from higher truths so god created this ability where we're not forced we're not born into this world and we're forced to do these things but that we actually have the freedom to choose and in that there's actually a beauty because we're we have to recognize and we have to do a lot of internal work in order to overcome some of these inclinations and this these things that give us almost like a spiritual gravity that doesn't help us ascend so the author of a thinking person's guide to islam he says it beautifully he says god created people to be free they are free even to reject his mercy and love and by extension 
They are free to reject goodness, and they are free to be evil. So we have the two paths. And a lot of people, you know, they get pulled in a particular direction, and it takes an active effort for the vast majority of people to choose the path of goodness, to choose the path of his love and mercy. And one of the great imams of Islam, Imam al-Ghazali, he says that the road to God's love is one that requires struggle. It requires effort. And it's a long road. And you have to be determined. You have to be really committed. And he says, but it's all worth it. You realize how precious and how valuable the goal is through the nature of the struggles that you have to traverse along the path, the obstacles that you have to overcome uh, along the way to God's love. So he created that within us, right? and that's why you see the world as it is. So then this brings us to the next point, false and true life. Right? I'm kind of putting these parentheses around it. Because we're not talking about, oh, we're in a dream and we're not actually really living. No, we don't believe that. This is life. God created us. We are in existence. This is real. But even in the life that we're experiencing, there's an access to the true purpose for which we were created. And there are a lot of people who can get pulled into a very false sense of living and life. So what is the false life? It's a life that's distant from God. False life is not actually realizing the purpose for which we were created. In the first session, we talked about this covenant that we took with God, that when God created the father of all humanity, Adam, and he brought forth all of the souls of human being before him, and he said, am I not your Lord? And he addressed them in the most beautiful way. And every human being experienced this, whether we remember it or not. This is in Revelation. So we as Muslims believe it to, it to be true. It's a fact that God addressed us. And then he said to Adam after he ate from the forbidden tree that I will send a reminder. And whoever follows my guidance will not be misguided, will not fail, but then will be restored to this higher existence in the heavenly kingdom. But a life in this world where a person does not respond to that deep void of seeking deeper purpose and meaning in life, and then they give in to and indulge their passions. That's the false life. And a lot of people are caught up in that life. They think that that's what it's all about. And in many verses of the Quran, God describes these people who are indulging in these passions and not seeking a greater purpose as people who are willfully deaf and blind, meaning that they're blind to the truth and that they're unwilling to listen to the reminder. Doesn't mean that being blind and deaf is a bad thing, but these are people who are will they can see, but they're willingly blind. They can hear, but they don't want to hear the truth. And it's a life that lacks faith and lacks meaning. And if we look at today's world, this is, this is really a reminder for us, something we have to take really seriously, is that we see that so many people are chasing after happiness. Happiness is this, you know, ever-elusive goal. I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want, okay, how do I be happy? Well, just get a, you know, a raise and you're going to be happy. Get a little bit more money, you're going to be happy. Fulfill your passions and your desires and you're going to be happy. Have people validate how good you look and you're going to be happy. Get a nice car, a nice house, and you're going to be happy. But the funny thing is, is that it seems ever elusive. People get that. It didn't really give me that sense of fulfillment that I thought it would. Yeah, it's nice for a little bit, but then it goes away. And they actually did a study, an extensive psychological study, where they gauged people's extrinsic 
and intrinsic goals. An extrinsic goal is something outside of yourself. Like that, the, those clothes are gonna make me feel happy. That money is gonna make me feel happy. That promotion and other people respecting me is gonna make me happy. And then intrinsic goals. I wanna be a more grateful person. I wanna be a better son or a better father or a better mother or a better sister. I want to be more generous. I want to take care of other people in need and not just think about myself. Those are intrinsic goals. So they did this study where they had people really uh, record and keep a diary of their feelings and how happy these things really made them. And they found that those people who were able to achieve their extrinsic goals, the money, the cars, the promotion, whatever it may be, that it increased their happiness by zero to none, by little to none. Didn't make them happier. Why? Because that's not real life. That's not what you were created for. It's going to give you a, a high for a little short while, and then you still got the same problems. But then they found that those people who were able to achieve their intrinsic goals of being kinder and more merciful and a better family member and so forth, that they actually had significant improvement to their sense of happiness. And we live in a world today where we have never been more self-indulgent in our own selves and self-obsessed, and it's no wonder that it's making us even more miserable because you see that mental health on a general level is deteriorating, that you have addictions on the rise, that you have suicide rates especially among younger people, you know, rising at a, an alarming rate. It's always alarming, but that the, the, the numbers are going up at an alarming rate, and that's that false life. All of the, the, the dunya, what we call in Arabic in the Islamic context, it's called dunya, this worldly life. Now, the gift of life is one thing. That God has brought us into this world is a gift but that we assume that this life, these material things, is it? That's what is referred to in a negative sense in Islam as the worldly life, this false life. It's not going to give us the happiness that we seek. And God says in the Quran about this, attaching ourselves to this uh, kind of low experience of life, this very empty surface level experience of life, the life of this world, God says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Whoever turns away from my reminder is revelation. Come back to me. This is the invitation to come to know God and to worship Him, and to be granted His mercy and love. Whoever turns away from my reminder will certainly have a miserable life. This is what God says in the Quran. Then we will raise him blind on the day of judgment. And then the next verse says that the person asks, Oh God, why am I blind now when I used to be able to see? And then God says to him, Our signs came to you and you forgot about them. So today you are among those who are forgotten. You were spiritually blind, and then that spiritual blindness manifests in the hereafter, which we'll talk about more in session four. And the person says, why am I blind now when I used to be able to see? Well, did you really see? The signs came to you. So this is an indication that whoever turns away from this access to the true life will have a miserable life. It's not the fullness of life. This is what isn't what we were created for. And the reminder that God sends us with the prophets and messengers and with revelation is meant to help us find the purpose for which we were created. And when a person turns away, they live an empty life. I mean, one of the things that breaks my heart, we're not looking down on anyone. Every single person on the face of the earth, we believe, is our brother and sister in humanity. But it breaks my heart how many 
wealthy, famous people who had everything that people chase after end up taking their own lives. So you start to realize, okay, everyone thinks that that's going to make you happy, but those people themselves don't seem to be happy. And even society lifts them up like they're larger than, than life and then loves to tear them down. And it's just really sad to see that. So there's something else that God is really calling us to. So what does God say about those who answer God and his messenger's call? He says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu istajibu lillahi wa lirrasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. O believers, respond to God and his messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life. Isn't that beautiful? That which gives you life. And this doesn't mean that the physical life, we all have that. We wouldn't be able to even have this conversation if we weren't already alive in the material sense. But this is something much deeper. And this refers to the life of the heart, your spiritual life that is acquired through faith, through belief in God. And scholars, when commenting on this verse of the Qur'an, they say because disbelief and ignorance is a form of death. Disbelief and ignorance is a form of death. And how many people, when they, sometimes they live a life of, of uh, uh, immorality, they hurt people, they harm people, they don't care about anyone but themselves, and then sometimes they end up even uh, in prison, and oftentimes you see that they have a transformation in prison. And they say it's, it's as if they came back to life. I have a new chance. That wasn't really me. So this is that kind of rebirth in a sense. And this type of life, the spiritual life of believing in God and his messenger, of living according to what God has called us to, that is a life that gives a person an access to life that doesn't end when we die and leave this world. That's that physical death. But the spiritual life continues on. And once again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in session four. But this is a life that does not end when your heartbeat stops and when your soul leaves your body. It continues on. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does that good life look like? What is this life that God is calling us to? How does that really play out in the world? Because once again, we're talking about not being worldly, but that our opportunity is here in the world, and that's a gift. So what does it look like? That brings us to this idea of the good life this idea of the good life. The first aspect that we'll look at of the good life is, once again, this is something that is referred to uh, explicitly in the Qur'an. God says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحِيَّنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا Whoever does any good deed, whether male or female, and is a believer, we will surely bless them with a good life. So once again, we've looked at a few different understandings in the Qur'an. We looked at this idea of the miserable life, turning away from God. We've looked at being responding to that which gives us life, the spiritual life. And then God tells us here that they will be granted with a good life. And we will certainly reward them according to the best of their deeds. Scholars who comment on this verse of the Quran, uh, and it's actually, no, this verse of the Quran, they say that this good life means that God grants blessings in one's provisions that whatever you've been given whatever god gives you that there's a blessing in that 
that you have doors open up for you that allow you to attain in a, in a good way, in a wholesome way, that you're able to uh, acquire provisions and your livelihood, and God puts blessing in that. Another meaning of the good life is that God gives you contentment and satisfaction in your life. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, he said that being rich is not having a lot of things. Being rich is not having a lot of things. And a lot of people are really blinded by that kind of understanding. I just need to have, if I have a little bit more money, if I have more of this, more of that, the next thing. And we live in this consumer culture where our economy is sustained by, you know, just things that are very temporary and then getting the new thing, the new phone, new clothing, all of these things. So we're always in this mode of the next thing that's going to fulfill you know, this, this deeper need of mine, but then it doesn't really give us that sense of fulfillment. So here, this good life, whoever does good, whether male or female, and is a believer, we will surely bless them with a good life, means that God will grant you contentment and satisfaction. As the Prophet Muhammad said that being rich doesn't mean having a lot of things, but being rich means that you've been granted satisfaction and contentment. You could have anything in the world, what would it be? You know what, I'm good. I don't really feel like all of these things are missing in my life. I have my connection to God. I know why I was created. I have this sufficiency in my heart that I know material and extrinsic things is, are not gonna give to me. I'm happy. Yeah, there are other nice things that I might want. It doesn't mean that you don't want clothes or those things are permissible. Whatever God has allowed us to have, there's nothing wrong in that. But recognizing that's not the reason for which you were created. It's much deeper than that. Another meaning that scholars uh, identify is that this good life means that you will be granted God's enabling grace to engage in more righteous deeds which will then lead you to God's love. He will continue to bless you to do more and more and more righteous deeds and that you will have steadfastness along the path until you are granted his love. All of these things are gifts from God and they're deeper than just more stuff. So this is another indication of the good life. One of the major aspects of the good life is family. You know, one of the things, uh, they say, you know, the best things in life are free. And there's a lot of truth to that. We have to overcome uh, this very materialistic mindset. Is that some of the greatest gifts that we've been given, and sometimes burdens, we have to be, we have to be honest, Sometimes it's a test and a challenge, but uh, in many ways, family is part of the good life. And what does that mean? Maybe a person comes from a difficult family situation, but that you realize in your life that investing in my family, investing in the relationships that God has given me, the relationships that are connected by the womb, which God has made honored in his sight, these uh, kinship ties, is part of the good life. Is part of the good life, is living this life that God is pleased with, this life of meaning and virtue and dignity and honor. God says in the Quran, for your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him and that you honor your parents is really interesting. After talking about the most important aspect of faith, which is belief in God and not worshiping anything or anyone other than him, God reminds us and honor your parents and be good to your parents. And then he says, if one or both of them reach old age in your care, 
never say to them even uf. Uf in the Arabic language, this is a word in the Quran, is the lowest or the mildest expression of annoyance. Uf. Again, don't even say that. That God wants us to, it's not easy. But once again, the good life is not necessarily the easy life, but it is the moral life. It is the virtuous life. It is the life of the heart. It is the life that God loves for us to live. So it takes a mujahada. It takes this spiritual struggle in order to have this level of goodness towards one, one's parents. And the older they get, the more likely they are to also you know, uh, get a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, sensitive. And they might forget things, and they might say things with a little bit more bite to it. Or they might say something like, you're always like that. You're always going to be like, <sighs> it's not easy for the nafs. The lower self, the ego, uh, you know, finds that really hard to deal with. But this is part of the good life. So then God says, rather address them respectfully and God says and make the prayer pray for them and say my Lord have mercy on them just as they showed me mercy when I was a baby you know my son last night woke up so many times in the middle of the night and just interrupted sleep and he wasn't feeling well and you can't imagine your own parents doing that for you when you grow up especially I'm speaking for myself I think I come from a generation that's a little bit more self-centered than previous generations. You think, you know, I did it all myself. I'm a self-made person and all of that, that type of, you know, uh, uh, that ideology that really permeates so much of our time. And you forget, like, my parents did all of that for me. They sacrificed their time, their energy, how many sleepless nights, you know, how much love did my mom put into meals that she made. How hard was my dad working at work in order for us to live a dignified life? And you forget about that until you kind of experience it. You're now in, in those shoes. So it's, it's hard for us to fully appreciate. And once again, I recognize also we live in a time where not everyone comes from that type of family or has that same type of experience. But even for those who never had that themselves, if and when God gives them the opportunity to be a parent or to be part of a family, then they realize, I didn't have that, and I realize how much was missing. I'm going to work even harder to provide that for my family. Even if I don't necessarily have a whole lot in the bank, in the, the love bank that was given to me, I'm still going to make the most of what I have to invest in that for my family and for the next generation. And then you realize that that is one of the most meaningful pursuits. So this is one of the areas that God tells us about. Another area is uh, with our spouses. And marriage is a cornerstone of society and family. And this is really important for us as, as Muslims, not because, you know, everyone has to get married uh, especially in times where it might not be as easy as it was in closer-knit societies and, and pre-modern societies. But it's important for us because for the moral fabric of society, marriage is a cornerstone. It is the building block for the family, and the family is part of the collective that makes a society. And God says in the Quran about the beauty of marriage and part of the good life is seeking to be a good spouse, a good husband or a good wife. That God says in the Quran, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ From his signs, أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ he created for you spouses from among yourselves so that you may find comfort in them. That once again, this goes back to the good life. And we live in a time, 
uh, especially uh, young men, but it's not just young men, where people don't feel the need to or the desire to get to ma- uh, to get married because they're so absorbed in I just want to live my life. I want to be free. I don't want to be tied down by anyone. I don't want to owe anyone else a sense of duty or to have responsibilities towards them. I'm good. And it once again plays into this very selfish mindset which is very unfulfilling. Now, if someone doesn't want to get married for other reasons, there are other reasons, and that's that's fine. But when we're talking about this perspective of faith, that you actually find fulfillment in service to others, your family, your spouse, whatever it may be, God says that he created for you spouses from among yourselves so that you may find comfort in them, an internal, emotional, and spiritual comfort. And then he says something beautiful. God, the most exalted, he says, and he, God, placed between you love and mercy. And there are multiple words in the Quran for, uh, in Arabic for love and in the Quran as well. One of the words is mahabba. Mahabba means love. Here in this verse, God says mawadda, which is another word for love. What's the difference between these two Uh, synonyms, these words in Arabic that both mean love, there's a slight difference between the two. Mahabba, the type of love that's not mentioned here in this verse, can be concealed. That type of love can be concealed. I love muhafil, but I might not tell him that every day. I can conceal it. It's a love that's concealed. Most days. I love you. I'll tell him that now. Right? But, Mawadda is a love that is expressed verbally and through action. Mawadda is not a love that's concealed. And when God talked about the relationship of marriage, he talked about the kind of love that's not concealed, that is actively expressed, and mercy. So this is another part of the good life, the moral and virtuous life. And then children whether they're our own children or children in society, part of the good life is being merciful and kind and loving to children. So all of this is related to family and society. And then another area of great importance in the good life, the moral life, is being good to neighbors. You know, I remember when, especially when I was in Canada, like when you're in a bigger city, people, you know, you don't know how people are, what people are like. So oftentimes people really are guarded. You know, they have their boundaries and you might see someone, you might live just one door down and never say hi to that person or never have a conversation with them. And that's not good for us. One of the things that is really being lost in society is a sense of trust. And one of the most amazing uh, statistics that I heard recently is that they found a correlation between the safety in a particular neighborhood and the correlation between that and neighbors knowing each other's first names. That the more people in a neighborhood who know each other's first names, the safer that neighborhood tends to be. Because people are tight. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, he said, I swear by God, he is not a believer. I swear by God, he is not a believer. I swear by God, he is not a believer. They said, who? O Messenger of Allah, O Messenger of God. This is a way to catch people's attention. What's going on? This is serious. He said, a person who eats their fill while their neighbor goes to sleep hungry. We have to look out for each other. That's part of the good life. That's part of the life that God loves from us. And these are some of the virtues that need to be restored in our societies here, in our communities here. And these were considered not too long ago American values that need to be revisited and restored. And that brings us to 
another aspect of the moral life or the good life is living a life of virtue, is living a life of virtue. And I wanted to read now from a book called Man and the Universe by Dr. Mustafa Al-Badawi. And we'll put a link to this book in the description on YouTube. And he talks about the person of faith, the Muslim, the one who follows the religion of Islam and follows the Prophet Muhammad and all of the prophets that came before, how they live a life of virtue. So he talks about a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, in which he says, I was only sent to perfect noble character. So all of religion, our religious experience and our religious practice is not something that's limited to the mosque. It's not something that's limited just to prayer and worship. It's something that permeates every aspect of our lives. Our connection to God influences the way that we treat our neighbors, influences our work ethic, the way that we deal with people, and how we live a life of virtue that then is a, an expression of beauty and goodness in the world and in society. So he says, it is possible to conceive of all of this noble character, uh, of, it, of it including three basic virtues. Namely, dignity, generosity, and courage. Dignity, generosity, and courage. So he says, the dignity of a Muslim has its roots, as do all other virtues, in his or her tawheed. They're affirming the oneness of God. And is the consequence of his seeing all created beings as within the palm of their creator under his control and of clearly perceiving them, perceiving in them the signs of his presence and power. Awareness of this awesome presence inevitably creates respect for all creatures. Everyone was created by God. Everyone. So they're deserving of respect, including oneself. It makes one humble, but never servile, like allow people to uh, humiliate you. Gentle, but never weak. There is a hadith, a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, which says that God is gentle and he loves gentleness. It makes one feel independent of others and well protected, but because he is aware of his own powerlessness and that of others, the dignity of a believer never turns to pride. It's a dignity that extends from knowing that God takes care of all of us and not a, an arrogance that makes one think that they are better than others. And God says in the Quran that we created you into different peoples and different tribes so that you can get to know one another. And then God says, the most honored of you in God's sight are those who have the most God consciousness, are those who are the most pious. So in the sight of God, black, white, male, female, this ethnicity, that ethnicity, this you know, socioeconomic status, rich, poor, whatever it may be, in the sight of God, the most honored and virtuous of all people are those who are the most pious. And that door is open to anyone. So when we treat one another uh, we, when we interact with one another, we treat each other with this understanding that God created us to understand one another, to appreciate the beauty in the differences, to appreciate the wonders in God's creation in the variety and the various flavors of different peoples and cultures and languages and the way people dress and their expression is beautiful. Now, there might be things in some cultures that is not pleasing to God. That particular thing needs to be reoriented or left away, done with. Someone comes from a society, for example, that has a particular custom or practice. For example, some cultures, when a husband dies, a woman, her life is over. According to our understanding of Islam, that's not what God wants. 
So that particular thing should be done away with. The other beautiful things are to be recognized and celebrated and appreciated. And we respect one another and realize no matter where that person is in a worldly sense, with God they might have a high position, so I have to respect them. So that goes back to this concept of dignity and treating others with dignity. So then he continues and he says, dignity imposes upon men restraint of their tongues and therefore forbids them stooping so low as to lie, slander, backbite, spread rumors, create scandal, or use obscenities. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, he said, he who believes in God and the last day, the day of judgment, should speak in a noble manner or else remain silent. Now just imagine how you preserve your own dignity and the dignity of others. This is the good life. Not using obscenities, not lying, slandering people, backbiting them. Dignity also contains modesty. Since modesty and faith are close companions, should one of them be lost, the other will be too. Modesty means, this all goes back to dignity. These are all kind of subsections of dignity. Modesty means to attire oneself decently, behave with propriety towards the opposite sex, and maintain courteous behavior at all times. It also means to refrain from eavesdropping, spying, and meddling in other people's affairs. All of that comes from this sense of modesty and restraint and temperance, which is considered one of the cardinal virtues. It is part, the Prophet Muhammad said, peace and blessings of God be upon him, it is part of the soundness of a person's faith that he leaves alone that which does not concern him. The second constituent element of nobility is generosity. So we were talking about dignity. Now he talks about generosity and that we should be people who are generous. We should take care of those in need. We should be good to our neighbors and to our guests. We should take care of one another. We should give gifts. These are all aspects of the good life. It is rooted in gratitude for the uninterrupted flow of graces and favors from the divine treasury and implies a minimum amount of detachment from the lures of the world in both their physical and social forms. It is the expansive counterpart of egocentricity. To give what you love. On the material plane, it is to give freely and liberally for no worldly gain to prefer others to oneself and yet still consider oneself in God's debt. I owe God for all the blessings that he has given me. The Prophet Muhammad was described by his companions, never was the Prophet asked for anything, and he said no. He would always give if people requested of him. Generosity is to give freely of one's emotions and show compassion to all created beings. As the Prophet Muhammad also said, have compassion for those on earth and the one in heaven will have compassion on you. It is to forgive all personal offenses and refrain from thinking ill of others or exposing their weaknesses and shortcomings. Once again, just imagine, these are, these are lofty virtues. It's not easy. It's easy to read it in a book. Very difficult to put it into practice, especially if someone wrongs you or you don't like someone. But this is the good life. This is the life of a virtue. Uh, this is what it means to be a Muslim in reality, inwardly and outwardly. So then finally he says, the last constituent is courage or the regulation of the instinct of self-preservation, which lies midway between recklessness and cowardice. And as stated before, between lack of control and aggression on the one hand and lack of assertiveness and vulnerability on the other, physical courage is required in war and other dangerous situations. Moral courage is to speak the truth even when bitter, 
to be a witness for the truth even against oneself or one's kin and to enjoin good and forbid evil against opposition. So these are some of the aspects of the good life as it relates to our families, as it relates to society, as it relates to being people of beautiful character. And in summary, the uh, author of A Thinking Person's Guide to Islam, he actually says this in another of his books, which is called uh, A Thinking Person's Guide to the Truly Happy Life. He says, in summary then, human beings have a choice between a negative, worldly life, which is futile and subhuman, this life of just, I want to give in to my passions, I want the best food, the best clothes, I want fame and people to admire me, and I want to just live uh, without any type of restraint or higher meaning. He calls it futile and subhuman and not real life. Or we also then have the choice between that and a positive, fully human life of enduring goodness and righteousness. So God gave us that choice. And this is really the life of dedicating ourselves to him and seeking that path of morality and goodness and faith and uprightness, which leads us to his love. And thank you for your time. I hope that this has given insights into the beauty of Islam and the understanding of living a good life in this world. All praise belongs to God, and may his peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad and upon all the prophets and messengers. Ameen. Thank you for watching one of Al Maqasid's online educational offerings. Our mission at Al Maqasid is to cultivate holistic learning environments rooted in knowledge, devotion, and service. For more information, please visit our website at almaqasid.org and connect with other online content at almaqasid.org slash connect.